Bless the Lord. It's been an interesting week. Um, you know, I had somebody come in un uh, unannounced to see me this week. And uh, I just want to, you know, kind of give a warning out. This person was from one of the name-only groups. I don't know if you ever heard of those those people. They are, are cultish, and they are belligerent, and they try to convince everybody in the congregation that their way is right, and they're very vocal about it. Uh, pretty much uh, what the name-only group is, because the scripture says, under no other name under heaven is there by which you must be saved. So they take the premise saying that if you don't say Yeshua or the Jesus name properly, you are not saved. <laughs> That's what I did. I laughed. <laughs> and I said, you know, how the hundreds of millions of believers, born again believers, that either got saved under Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus, or all the other names that they called Jesus, says, how can you say something like that? And they're all born again. And he looked at me and says, how do you know they're born again? I said, you know what? I know all about you guys. You're not welcome in this house. You create nothing but, but disunity and confusion. You are not welcome in this house. Do not come back. Amen. And uh, uh, Judy was... In the front office, she could say she could hear my hackles getting up, <laughs> and uh, I mean, I just righteous indignation for somebody coming. The first thing he did, Judy told me later when he came in the door, start condemning our banner because we didn't have the right way to spell God on that banner. You know, when God is known by so many things, you know, when Moses says, "What is your name?" He said, "What I am." So which name do you use for the Lord? They're all his name. It's, it's, if it's in the Bible, they're all part of him. It represents him in many, many different ways. So, uh, that, so when I just, my hackles got up and I got a little forceful with that guy, he finally realized, I better get out of here. Yay. So he, he, he took off. But uh, you have to watch out for these so-called messianic cults too there are christian cults and there are messianic cults there are several different types of messianic cults the the Ephronite movement is another messianic cult that they believe that the lost tribes of israel settle in england so <laughs> yeah so unless you're english you're not of the tribes of israel you know it's holy mackerel you know these things these people get carried away i don't know about you but the bible says that we are grafted in when you believe you're grafted into the house of Israel, I don't care what nationality you are. But everybody wants to believe that they are the only ones, you know. And, and, and that's why Yeshua said, I have many more sheep that are not of this house. He said that. So because we are part of those other sheep that were not of that house. And so for people to zero in on stuff like that, you got the black Hebrew movement that swore up and down. They are the only ones, uh, as well as all these Christian cults. There's a lot of Christian cults out there, too. Just because they call themselves Christian doesn't make, make it right. You have to examine what people believe in, and I would not going to tolerate somebody coming here and creating confusion, and I know about those name-only people. They're in your face. So like when you walked in, you start condemning our banner right off the bat. Instead of being gracious himself to us, he began immediately with his condemnation. So I'm glad he's gone. And I hope he never returns. This, you got to watch these things very carefully. All right, you, you keep your mouth, Judy. You keep your mouth. And Judy will, too. <laughs> and so will Regina. Yeah, you get all these kind of strange people that all, all that what they want to do is steal your congregation or they want to create disunity and cause trouble so if if you're involved in anything or people are talking to you about stuff like that turn them down it's not biblical don't listen to them it's not biblical it's just that pride thing that i got something you don't have 
And that's a bad thing when you start treating uh, the scriptures like that. I know something you don't know. Ah, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> I have it right and you don't. Nah, 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 nah. So, well, why don't you go talk to God about that? Says, I know I'm born again, and I've met millions of people in my journeys that are born again, and they would take great offense. You say, are you really born again? Because you didn't say God's name right. How shameful is that? All of you guys, under what name did you get saved? Yeshua? Jesus? Jesus? You know how many different ways there is to say Jesus in the world? In my world travels, I've heard all kinds of different names, but they're talking about the son of the living God of Israel, of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They know who they are talking about, and my God is big enough to understand when you're talking about him, and he will reach out to you. Amen. You don't have to turn around and think, oh my gosh, I need to find the right way to say his name or I'm not saved. A lot of people don't understand you know, how the word you, you, Jesus even came about. The word Jesus came back from the Greek, which was Isus. And Isus, when it became English, was Jesus, because there were no J's in Hebrew. And in modern English, it became G, from Jesus to Jesus. It was a transliteralization over time how we got the name Jesus. But you know what? Jesus knows who you're talking about. You can say Isus. Jesus, Jesus, he knows you're talking about him. And he's called to turn around saying that you're saying Zeus or hail Zeus. That's another Christian cult when you say Jesus. You know, dismiss those people. I got saved under the name of Jesus when I called his name out. And his spirit entered me and I knew I was changed and born again. So I resent people like that. And as Judy could testify, <laughs> <laughs> Hackles went up. It's nonsense. I'm going to give you truth here as best as I can. I'm going to give you truth here. And I'm also going to warn you about the untruthers that are out there too. <clears throat> Last week I was talking about Yom Teru. We're going to continue that. And we're going to talk about a lot of the scriptures today that are involved uh, with the rapture concepts today. That many people say will happen in Yom Teru. Uh, I don't believe that I believe in several raptures I believe there's a first fruits rapture and just think about this alone when Thessalonians said the dead in Christ arise first and then later those which are still alive and re survive or remain as King James says will be raptured then that's two raptures itself it's not going to be boom boom what is the dead in Christ talking about? Probably the martyrs. That's probably the martyrs under the golden altar. And then everybody else gets raptured later on. So I call those the first fruits raptures. We know that when the barley first fruits came, when Jesus rose from the dead, there was a rapture at that point too. Because yes. many of the dead rose from the dead at the same time Yeshua did and were seen throughout the city. That's a rapture in itself. So there's not just one rapture. And that's why the Apostle Paul says the rapture will occur with every man in his own order. Now why would Paul say that if there was only one rapture? Every man in his own order tells you there's several raptures. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So uh, we'll start off with Psalm 17 verse 15. It says, As for me, I will behold your faith, face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with your likeness. The scripture tells us that we do not know how we should look in our new incorruptible bodies, but we shall be like him, Yeshua. <clears throat> Colossians 3, 4 says, <clears throat> When Messiah, who is our life, shall appear, then you shall also appear with him in glory. Now that's an interesting scripture. It's saying that when the Messiah appears, that's the sign of the Son of Man. That's what appearing is all about. The sign of the Son of Man. When the heavens open up and lightning is from east to west and the whole world will see this appearing of him sitting on the throne of God, we will appear with him. That's that cloud that talks about Messiah having the cloud around him. It's all of the believers. 
Now, why are you going to look like a cloud? Because you will be getting your new resurrected bodies and your garments of light, and you will shine around him, will gather around him. So it says, we will appear with him in glory. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, and we shall see him as he is. So there's several scriptures right there indicating what are we going to look like? We're going to look like him. Maybe not in the same glory, <clears throat> but we're going to look like him. You know, Revelation tells you what he looked like when John, when he appeared to John. You know, the booming voice and the garments of lies, brass of, th you know, thighs of brass. Just quite scary, actually. When Yeshua was the Lamb of God on the earth, he was very humble and people came to him. Yeshua today is different. When he received his glory in heaven, he can be actually terrifying when he appears. It's not going to be the lamb. But Yeshua will show himself however he wants to show himself. So individually, people may get a glimpse of Yeshua every now and then as, 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 as a kind shepherd, a lamb of God. But his actual form is God. The Bible says Yeshua created all things. He's God. It's terrifying. But it says what a terrible thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. So when Yeshua comes back for judgment, woe be to the world. He's not coming back <clears throat> as the Lamb of God. When he leaves that throne room, he's coming back for judgment. Today, he takes on the role of the Lamb of God. Because he's at the right hand of the Father, atoning for everybody. But there's coming a day, and you can see this in Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, when all power, authority, and glory is given to the Son, and he sets on the throne of God. Now that rapture's over, because it also says, now is the time for rewards for the saints, the prophets, and those that fear his name. That is the bema seat of the Messiah. That's when we receive our garments of light, our crowns, our thrones, and all those things. Because he sits on the throne, he has all authority to do that. That's why it says in Revelation, the church is a revelation. If you overcome, you will rule the nations with a rod of iron with him. And you'll have thrones with him. Are you ready for that? <laughs> Are you ready for that? Yeah. All right. We got, we, it may be a shocker to you, but that's what is promised us. Can you believe that? What Yeshua is going to do with you? Eyes have not seen, nor ears have heard of the things that God has for those who love him. Amen. You're going to have thrones if you overcome with Yeshua. Amen. And you're going to rule the nations like him with a rod of iron. Wow. You never thought you were going to be a ruler, did you? The Bible says you're going to be kings and priests. What do kings do? Rule. What do priests do? Minister. You're going to be doing both. Upon the earth at that time as it slowly starts to repopulate from all the disasters of the seals, trumpets, and the vials being poured out by the wrath of God. Humanity will not be destroyed on the earth in the tribulation, but it will take a major hit. A major hit during that time. Songs of Solomon, chapter 2, 8 through 13, is a good one to read. I will talk particularly about uh, 10 through 13 here. It says here in verse 10, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. The whole chapter 2 of the Songs of Solomon is about the love of God he has for his church or for his people. This time about the bride of the Messiah. So he's saying, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. That's this rapture scripture. Very important to understand that. But then you go on to verses like 13, 11 through 13. It tells you when. <laughs> yeah. It says, when the bud is in the grape flower of the vine. 
When do grapes bloom? In the spring. They bloom in the spring, particularly around April and May. Right around Shavuot, the wheat first fruits period. The Holy Spirit came down at that time. It looks like the first fruits rapture will also occur at the same time. But that's not the last rapture. The big harvest rapture may in fact be right around Yom Teruah period. The period we're on right now. But you got to remember, when the bud is in the flower, that's when the bride is caught up. The bride is caught up at that time. We'll talk some more about that here in a moment. Isaiah 18, verses 3 through 5, says this. All you inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, you see it when he lifts up an incense on the mountains, and when he blows a trumpet, you hear it. That's when the sign of the Son of Man appears, there will be a trumpet blown. There are several major incidences that occur in the Bible when a trumpet blows. That's one of them. Isaiah is talking about it. It represents the rapture. And so Isaiah says, when you see the sign and hear the trumpet, then Isaiah goes on to say, For so the Lord said unto me, I will take my rest and I will look from my dwelling place like clear heat in the sunshine. What in the world is Isaiah talking about? <laughs> well, it doesn't take long with a strong concordance to break those words down and realize what he's talking about. King James people did not translate this properly because King James at that time didn't even understand what the rapture was. And those scholars at that time didn't even understand the rapture. Today we understand it. So when you break those words down in the strong, strong concordance, you find out it says, I will take my rest. In other words, he will get his shalom, the peace. He'll go to, and he'll take his peace with God. All right, he says, and I'll look from my dwelling place or look upon my dwelling place. That's talking about his body. He will look upon his dwelling place. This is Isaiah. And he says, it would be like clear heat in the sunshine. All right, that word clear could be translated white, dazzling, bright. The word heat can be translated hot or inflamed. Sunshine can be translated light or luminaries. What that is saying is Isaiah is going to be transformed when the trumpet blows and the sign appears. That's a rapture for Isaiah and he's going to appear suddenly in a glorious body that will shine like the luminaries. Do you know what a luminary is? No, 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 no. It's bigger than that. Stars, sun, all those kind of things. That's what a luminary is. So Isaiah will consider his body and it will shine like the sun, basically. That translation says sunshine. But the word is in Hebrew is, means luminaries. Any bright, super light that God has created. This is what he's saying. So Isaiah says, I will consider my body, when the sign appears and the trumpet blows, I will consider my body. And it will shine bright. That's the garments of light that God will give us. Do you want garments of light? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You better. I always kid around with this, but in Ezekiel, I, can't, I think it's around chapter 43. Don't hold me to that, but it's around there somewhere. in the millennial reign is talking about that the priests will enter into the holy place and they will put on their holy garments before the Lord. And when they go outside the holy place to the outer court, they will minister to the people in the outer court, but they have to leave their garments behind. So what garment would they put on and what garment would they take off? It's your garments of light. Your garments of light. So I just get around and go, clap on, clap off, <laughs> light on, light off. So when you're ministering before the Lord, you have your light on. When you leave that place, you turn your light off. Least you sanctify the people in the outer court. That's what it says in Ezekiel. You're not allowed to sanctify the people in the outer court because they missed it. You got it. They missed it. You're not allowed. That's why Moses covered his head when he came down from Mount Sinai because he was glowing. And he covered himself so he wouldn't sanctify the people. And so, so that's the state we're going to be in. But when we come before the Messiah again, we'll turn the garments back on, clap on, <laughs> minister before the Lord, 
And when you have to go outside, we turn the garments off. You just, you'll, you know, you'll, you won't be shining brightly when you go to minister before people. Because that light, that light is contagious. You know what I mean by that light being contagious? You're going to give light to other people. And the Lord said, no, you're not going to be allowed to do that. 44? Ezekiel 44. Thank you, Beth. Ezekiel 44. That's a good one to read about that. So you can look that one up. About ministering for the Lord with your garments on and your garments off. Wow. Then it goes on to say, in Isaiah 18, 3 through 5, like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. For before the harvest, when the bud is perfect, what it means when the bud is finished, is a better translation, and the sour grape is forming in the flower. You know, when a grape begins to form, the flower appears, the petals fall off the flower, and you start to see that little green bud in there. That's the grape ripening. This is what it's talking about. When does that take place? The spring. So Isaiah is saying here, I will have my rapture in the spring. So I'm saying that the, the first fruits raptures will be in the spring when the, when, the, when the first fruits celebration, the wheat first fruits, is being probably being celebrated. That's when that will occur. And it also goes on to say, he will cut off the sprigs with pruning hooks, and take away and cut down the branches. Anybody here ever feel like they've been pruned before? <laughs> if you haven't, you better ask the Lord to start pruning you. Well, I don't want to feel that. You better want to feel that. You want to be the perfect plant for the Lord. Get the dead branches off. And what happens when you prune a plant? It grows better. It's more beautiful. It produces more fruit. So the whole idea about pr pruning a tree or a plant like a grapevine is to produce more fruit. So if you are having being pruned and having branches cut off in your life, it is for the goodness of God to you so you become more fruitful. So don't complain when things don't go your way. The Lord just could be pruning. Amen? And we need to be pruned. Every one of us needs to be pruned. There's things in our lives that he's probably not pleased with. Let him prune it and accept it when you start getting pruned. Sure, you could talk to him. Say, what's going on, Lord? I don't like this, Lord. This hurts, Lord. What are you doing, Lord? And maybe he'll tell you why he's pruning. It's very important to let the Lord prune you. That's how you become more productive more productive you know we lead a life without any problems you become spoiled you don't want to be spoiled in the eyes of the Lord you want to be productive and you want to produce as much fruit as possible what that fruit is of course is just the fruit in the ways of the Lord the fruit and obedience to the Lord let him prune you you may be hurting. You may be having problems. Let him prune you and accept what he's doing and love him and serve him and you could be a magnificent fruit-bearing plant. <laughs> but the more you complain and <clears throat> cry about it and mad and mad at God about, <clears throat> there could be a chance in your life he just might cut the whole bush down. <laughs> you don't want that. <clears throat> So when you're being persecuted, the Bible says in Acts, you know, through much tribulation, you enter the kingdom of God. So much suffering and, and persecution, you enter the kingdom of God. That's what that word tribulation means. So don't count it as something you want to avoid. Count it all as joy. That's what Yeshua said. If you're being persecuted for righteousness sake, count it all as joy. That's what he said. He says, Lord, man, I'm getting it from all sides. I'm getting hammered. I'm getting beat up here. And this is happening. This is happening. I don't feel much like joy. He ain't asking you what you feel like. He says, count it all as joy. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
That's different than what the world says. There was a time in my life where there were all kinds of things were going crazy in my life. When I first moved from Page, Arizona down here, I went to work at a plant that I, I didn't think there were people like that alive that were that nasty and mean. It was unbelievable the troubles I went through. And they were trying everything they can to run me off. The Mormons hated me. They did not, they thought the promotion should have been theirs. I went through all this kind of persecution. But you know what? I counted all this joy. Right. And eventually I became in charge. He blessed me. He blessed me because I counted all this joy. I continued serving him and I put up with it. But when I became boss, there were consequences. Yeah. And I got rid of several people because they were causing so much disunity and hatred. So when I became boss, they were gone, just like that. So the Lord blessed me and gave me the authority and the power to correct the situation. But I don't bl didn't blame God. I don't go, why me, Lord? Why me? Why does it have to be me? And I can guarantee you asked the Lord that and you were listening very carefully, you go, why not you? <laughs> right? That's right? Why not you? Why not? So be careful about jumping all over God and complaining about your situation. Why not you? God wants to bless, but he also tells you, you follow my word and be obedient to me, you're going to be blessed. You go against my word, then curses are going to come upon you. So stop going against him. Be obedient to him. And sit, your situation will change over time. It may not change right away, but it will change because he's waiting to see your heart. How good is your heart? You say, well, I repent, Lord, I want to change. And the Lord says, okay, I'm going to give you a space of time to prove it. And you've got to do that. I know an individual one time, when I told him that, that he said, all right, I'll do that. Three weeks later, he changed to the worst. I said, I, I thought you were going to change. I did. I waited two weeks and nothing happened. <laughs> For years and years and years, you dug yourself a pit and a hole, and you expected God to change it all in two weeks? It doesn't work that way. God will change it, but you have to be continuing obedient to him and give him time because he's working in you a work and you've got to allow it to take place. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 tells us that the last trump, the dead in Messiah will be raised and changed. What is the last trump? And I don't mean the second term of Donald Trump either. The last trump, I believe, personally, myself, from the, my studies that I've done, the last trump is the seventh trump of Revelation. I believe that's the last trump. Some people try to say, oh, the last trump is the, the, the last blowing on Yom Teruah, or the last trump is the trump they blow on Yom Kippur. Uh, no. I believe the last trump is the seventh trump. Why do I say that? Again, right back to Revelation chapter 11, that whole chapter. The seventh trump, the last of the seven trumps, blow. And when it blows, the two witnesses are resurrected and raptured. That's right. And now all authority becomes Yeshua. He sits on the throne of God. And now is a time for rewards for the saints. That all happens at the seventh trump. You cannot give rewards to all the saints unless they've been raptured. So to me, that's the last trump. But if you have a difference of opinion, I'd be glad to hear it. <laughs> I'd be glad to hear it. But uh, the last trump, so I think Paul's right when, it, when he, we're talking about the last trump. It is the seventh trump of Revelation. <laughs> Psalms 27, verses 5 through 6. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. For in the time of trouble, the Lord will hide us. 
How does the Lord hide us? By the rapture. He hides us by the rapture. He takes us up. Verse 6 of Psalm 27 says, And now my head shall be lifted above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. You're going to be in his tabernacle. Not the one on earth, but the one in heaven. You're going to be in that tabernacle. And I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Zephaniah 2, 3. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. It's very important to understand when the Lord's wrath occurs. It tells us in Revelation that the seven vials being poured out is now has come the wrath of God. It's not the seals. It's not the trumpets. It's the seven vials. If you look at the seven vials in Revelation, it's global. Everything about it is global. All the sea turns to blood and every creature in it dies. How many people are going to die because there's no longer fish in the sea? Multiple millions, if not billions of people are going to die when the sea turns to blood. All the water, good water on earth, will turn to blood. How many people are going to die because they can't drink any water? Unbelievable. The sun will scorch mankind. You think it's hot in Phoenix? <laughs> Wait until that vial gets poured out. One of the vials is Armageddon. I talked about this here a couple weeks ago with the uh, Matthew 24. Where the carcass is so the eagles will gather. That's Armageddon. That's what it's talking about. When God gathers the nations for battle, he will destroy them. And then the birds of prey will come down and devour the flesh off the bones. That's what he's talking about. That's one of the vials being poured out. There will be a great earthquake where every city on earth will be leveled. No city will remain standing. Every city in the earth will be leveled on this great earthquake. How many people do you think is going to survive that? Some do. Some do manage to survive. That's why the earth has to repopulate. But after the raptures, both the first fruit and the final raptures, a lot of the people living on earth at that time will, will die with the seven vials at that time. And for certain, everyone that received the mark of the beast. Matter of fact, that's one of the vials poured out. It says, grievous sores come upon all those that have the mark of the beast. That's part of the seven vials, judgment. Hard times are coming. What triggers all that? We don't know for sure what triggers it. But all I know is when the sign of the Son of Man appears, we hear that trumpet call. It's a blessing for those who believe. It's going to be a curse for those that remain. You don't want to be here. That's why you want to tell people about Yeshua. That's why you want to tell people about Jesus. If you love people and you care about people, don't let them go to their death in that kind of situation. Tell them they got to get their life right with God because things are getting ready to happen. And when Yeshua leaves that throne to come down, grace and mercy is over with. Grace and mercy only exist today because he's at the right hand of the Father at the mercy seat. Once he becomes sitting on that throne and he leaves there to come to the earth, grace and mercy is over. You can't say, oh, oh, I see that now. Okay, well, okay, I believe now. Too late. Too late. Judgment's coming now. This is what he, he, you see the same example of the prophets in the Bible. God warned Israel and Judah several times. Stop, 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 or else. And finally God says, I've had it. I'm sending Babylon and the Assyrians on you. And all the people cried and moaned at that time. Did God stop them? Nope. No. Once he unleashed them, they came. And that's what's going to happen in the last days. You're not going to be able to look up and say, Oh, I believe now. Too late. Too late. Oh, man. Wake up, world. Wake up, world. 
Isaiah 52, 1 through 2. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise, sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Let's look at that a little closer. Awake! We sing that song. Awake! That's a term of the rapture. That's what that means. Awake! Put on your glorious garments, your beautiful garments. That's your garments of light yes. you're going to receive. Amen. Shake yourself from the dust. When you die, your spirit immediately goes to be with the Messiah. Amen. Goes to be with the Messiah. But you don't have your physical body yet. The rapture is to give you a physical body. And it'd be a body like Yeshua. Now, what did Yeshua do when he rose from the dead? You know, he went wherever he wanted to, real easy. He walked through walls. Right. He ate and drank with the disciples right. in his physical body. He could be touched. Thomas touched him. All these that's the way we're gonna be in the resurrection. You're gonna get a spiritual, physical body body to allow you to do about anything you want to do and you can be touched that is the resurrected body we're going to go angels always want to be like men men always want to be like angels you're going to have the best of both worlds because god loves you and you're special he's going to give you a body like that yeshua walked through walls he went from point a to point b when he thought about it Man, talk about a great mode of transportation. <laughs> no planes needed, you know, whatever. That's going to be awesome. So awesome. What God's going to do for us. Right? So when it says awake, it's talking about not your spirit. It's talking about receiving your physical body that Yeshua has. And like I read earlier, what will we look like? We will look like him will appear like him. Many people who have died, went to heaven and were sent back again, all said the same kind of thing, that all the people up there, even in their spirit, look to be the same age. You're not going to have the same body. So don't worry about, you know, being cremated. Don't worry about, you know, having your ashes scattered, you know, from everywhere. That's, you're not getting that body back. God's not going to suddenly start collecting all the DNA out there and give you your body back. Think about it. How many people were burned up and wind scattered their ashes? How many people were eaten by fish or burned up, you know, whatever? You're not getting the same body back. I remember one time I said that you're not getting the body back that you got now. Who in here would like to have their same body? And some little 14-year-old girl was sitting over and goes, I do. <laughs> well, that was great. But uh, you're not going to have the same body. You're going to appear like the Messiah. And it may be a shock to you, too. There is no marriages in heaven. Nope. No marriages. When you get married, it's not for all eternity. That is a, a Mormon doctrine. That is not true. Okay. Not true at all. You will be the bride of the Messiah. There are no marriages in heaven and no children being produced in heaven, unlike the Mormon doctrine that teaches that they still are. You still will have sex in heaven. That's crazy. Craziness. That's why it says there is neither male or female in Christ Jesus. You will not have a particular sex in heaven. If there is, we don't know the name of it yet. But I don't think there is. There won't be any gender identity problems in heaven. Right. There are no marriages in heaven. I mean, Yeshua talked about this a lot. There is no marriages in heaven. He talked about that. Even when the rabbis tried to, the Pharisees tried to trick him about some guy marrying this one woman, he dies, and his brother marries her, and then he dies, the next brother marries her, and all that. And he goes, whose husband will she be in heaven? What did Yeshua say? There is no marriages in heaven. That's not a problem. There's nothing to even think about or talk about. So, 
But today we, we also have Christian cults that believe there are. Not biblical. Not biblical at all. So we have to remember those things. And uh, we, we will not be married in heaven except to the Messiah himself. Daniel 12, 2 says, And many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Yeah. That is, again, just talking about you putting on a physical body. Back to Isaiah 52, one part I, I left off there in verses 1 and 2. It says, O captive daughter of Zion. That word captive, you look it up in Hebrew, it means, it means captive, it means prisoner, but it also means taken away. The daughter of Zion that is taken away, you're the one that's going to awake and put on a new garments upon yourself, a new body, an incorruptible body as Paul talked about. This body is corruptible. It bleeds. It dies. It gets sick. It has problems. The new incorruptible body is an eternal body. Wow. Man. Isaiah 26, 19 to 21. And this is Isaiah speaking to the Lord. Your dead men shall live. Together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is as the dew of herbs. And there's that mistranslation again about herbs. The word herbs in Hebrew means luminaries. Why did King James write herbs? It doesn't mean herbs. It means luminaries. For your dew, your mist, your light is as the luminaries is what it's saying. And the earth shall cast out the dead. Wow. You're going to shine. That's what it's talking about. You're going to get your garments of light. There's so many scriptures about your garments of light. This again is about the rapture, about believers rising into incorruptible bodies. The dew of herbs is better translated as a mist of shining like the luminaries. This would be like a cloud of brilliant light. It has nothing to do with herbs and dew. This would be our covering of light as the Lord gives us. This is why when it says when the Lord actually physically come back, he'll come back in the clouds because we've got him surrounded. <laughs> Recently I was talking to an individual who was doing some heavy studies on that. And he said, did you know it is a, a rabbinical idiom that when the Lord says he'll be coming covered with the clouds, that is the Lord himself, Yahweh, so when the Lord says, I'll be coming back in the clouds, it's actually saying and telling the rabbis, I am God. Because I will be covered with the clouds. But to better understand, we understand today the clouds is going to be us. We're coming back with him. We just read a scripture about we will come back with him. We'll come back with him to help execute judgment upon the earth. I hope you're ready for that. Wow. Wow. Continue Isaiah 26, verse 20 says, Come, my people, enter your chambers. That word chambers is the wedding bed chambers. Wow. But there won't be any sex there. That's not what we're talking about. God has got a place prepared for you, the dwelling place of his bride. And that's why they call it bed chambers. Goes on and say, Isaiah, shut your doors behind you. What happened to the parable of ten virgins? When the five went in, what happened? The door was shut. It's the same concept. The door was shut. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment. So the Lord is going to put us in these bed chambers. We're going to have the wedding feast of the Lord. He's going to hide us while he is pouring out his vials upon the earth. Till his indignation is over. So while we're having a wedding feast of the Lord, earth is under great persecution and tribulation. Aren't you glad? You know, the seals and the trumpets were going to be here. We've never been promised to escape the wrath of men and angels. We've only been promised to escape the wrath of God. So in seals and trumpets, there's all kinds of terrible things going on. And we will face persecution during those periods of time. But we will not face the actual wrath of God to be poured out upon the earth. 
So if you've been taught in the past about the raptures where you don't even stub a toe, you better rethink that because then God owns an, owes an apology to an awful lot of martyrs that have already died around the world. You've not been promised to escape that. You've just been promised to escape the wrath of God. When he pours it out on the earth, these days are coming. We count it all as joy. Rabbi, you sound weird. <laughs> when I should lie, count all the joy because I'm suffering. I'm not saying you sit there and have to laugh about it and smile about it. Oh, yeah, hit me again. That was great. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. In the heart, in your heart, count it all as joy. Wow. Wow. Until the indignation is past, verse 21, For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and no more will recover her slain. All things will be revealed. All the killings and murders, everything will be revealed. The wicked that people did will be revealed. They're not going to be able to hide from it. It will be revealed who buried Jimmy Hoffa in cement. Yeah. And Kennedy. All these things will be revealed. Wow. God will call his bride to him. This feast is also when uh, talking about Yom Teruah, where the coronation of a king takes place. In this case, this is where Yeshua most likely will sit on God's throne, as we see in Revelation chapter 11. Is a coronation of Yeshua as King of Kings. Also, this is most likely where the sign of the Son of Man will appear. Oh, you're going to be kick out of reading people that talk about that. Oh, the sign's going to be a cross. Oh, the <laughs> sign's going to be a fish. How about the sign be Him Himself? Yeah. That's what it's going to be, Him Himself. That's what the sign is. It's not going to be some symbolism that we're going. What's that fish doing up there? When people look up, they're going to know what it is. Oh, my gosh. They're going to know. Zechariah 12, 10, Israel themselves, unredeemed Israel at that time, will look upon the one whom they have pierced, and they will begin to mourn as the one who lost an only son. Because they're going to look up and going, Oh, my. The Messiah is Yeshua. After all this time, our rejection of him, our cursing of him, our curse words that we made up about him, our persecution of those that followed him is all going to come to their mind. But because of God's covenant with the house of Israel, that remnant that sort of survived that point in the tribulation, folks, more, most Israel will die by this point. About two-thirds of them will be dead by this point, as well as the rest of the world. You know, just don't think of the judgment falling upon Israel. This is the whole world. But that remnant that's still alive, God will redeem. Deuteronomy 30 says that he will bring that remnant out of captivity, out of Assyria, and out of Egypt. They will obey me. They will follow me. I will lead them into the land. And they will be no more removed from their land. Remember that seventh vial is the great earthquake mingled with hails of fire. Every city will be leveled. People have told me in the past that, but Israel today is rebuilding the country. They're rebuilding the cities. I said, that's great. They are doing that. But there's a day coming that they'll be leveled again. That's right. Those cities will be leveled again. But then God will redeem the captivity of Israel that's led into Assyria and Egypt. Because it says in the Bible, as they are getting ready to perish in those countries, God will appear and then he will lead them out of those countries and lead them like he did in the land of Egypt. When he brought them out of Egypt and lead them into the land, they'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. They'll all know him. They'll all obey him and never turn from him again. That has never happened. You can read that in Deuteronomy chapter 30. That's never happened before. So what happened in 1948 is a thing of God because you had to set that pattern in motion. So that was what, a thing of God in 1948, but it wasn't the final regathering. That day's coming. Who's leading them in the captivity? The beast of Revelation. 
is going to be take them into captivity. When he sweeps them all, all across the world, particularly the land of Israel, he's coming down to proclaim himself God in the temple, which tells you the temple has to be built. And he will lead Israel into captivity at that point and decimate the land. And I don't know at what point God would say enough, but somewhere in there he'll say enough. The sign will appear. The sign is also a sign to release the captives in the land of Assyria and Egypt. It's also a sign for the rapture also. So when that sign appears, a lot of stuff is going to happen. Has that sign appeared yet? No. no. You know, I don't know how long the sign is going to be there. I don't know, you know, if the sign appears for, for a week or a month. I don't know where in there that all this stuff will happen, but it'll be one thing right after another when it does. But folks, don't wait for the sign to appear to make a decision. Because it very well could be that as soon as that sign appears, the rapture occurs, and everybody else on this earth will perish. Or most everybody on this earth will perish at that time. Right? Got to believe. Got to believe today and follow the day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You never thought there was so much stuff about Yom Teruah, did you? Whoa. This Moed is also known as the Day of Remembrance. Yom Teruah is also known as the Day of Remembrance. Why is it called that? Because of the Bema Seed of the Messiah. When you get raptured, you will answer for everything you've ever did. 2 Corinthians 5, 9-11 says, Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of the Messiah, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that which he has done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest, which means made known, in your conscience. So, the judgment seat, to be in the seat of the Messiah. This is not a judgment unto condemnation and destruction. This is a judgment of rewards and positions in the kingdom. Everything you ever said or did has been logged. Everything. Yeah, I agree with Stu. Ooh. Ouch. And it's all going to be revealed. You're going to stand before the throne of God because Yeshua is now sitting on that throne. And he's going to pull out the DVD on it says Stu and put it in. <laughs> Can you go home? Right? <laughs> but basically, when, this, when they say your life flashes before your eyes, that's true. That's really what's going to happen. You're going to see your history whoo, before your eyes. And everything you ever said or did has been written down. Wow, Lord. I thought you got rid of all my sins. He does, but not until then. So you're going to see everything you ever did or said is going to suddenly be revealed. And while you're shaking there and shouting, like, what's next? All the, good. All the bad is erased right in front of you. And the good determines your rewards, what you did for the kingdom. So don't ever be upset about doing things for the Lord. I don't care if you're sweeping the floor or cleaning the toilet. God logs those things. He writes them down. So that's why the Bible says do everything with joy. Amen. He doesn't forget what you do. Oh, that's beneath me. I can't clean a toilet. Well, I'm sorry that you feel that way. Hand me a brush. I'll do it. Everything you do for the Lord is recorded. But when you complain, out comes a big spiritual eraser. <laughs> and it's written off your book of works. You don't want that. You want, you, you want to increase your books of works. For the rewards in the kingdom and position in the kingdom. That's important. The things that we do for God. 
That's why Yeshua says, anybody who gives, gives a glass of water to one of my disciples in no way will lose that reward. Just a glass of water to a thirsty disciple. Amen. It's logged. And there's reward for that. But if you complain, it gets canceled out. Do everything with joy before the Lord. Amen.